It's my pleasure uh, to welcome Matt Lepsock for our seminar uh, today. Uh, Matt is a research scientist at uh, JPL and the deputy PI of uh, the CloudSat mission. Um, his uh, research is focused on satellite remote sensing of clouds and precipitation using a combination of active and passive techniques, exploiting the visible uh, through the uh, microwave spectrum. So uh, we have a lot of people uh, who know a lot about this, not me. But, but So I'm really actually looking forward to uh, your seminar. Uh, Matt has a particular focus on boundary layer clouds, their role in climate, cloud coupling with thermodynamics and turbulence, and parameterization and evaluation of uh, planetary boundary layer moist processes and models. Um, Matt actually is a, actually I don't know if you're a Colorado native, but you certainly got your native. Even a Colorado native. He got his undergrad degree uh, at Colorado College uh, in physics and moved then to uh, CSU in Fort Collins, got his PhD in 2009, and in uh, 2011 uh, he moved to uh, JPL um, and has been working there ever since. Uh, he has more than 40 publications of a counted right, I can count exactly 11 first author papers, so it's quite prolific. And uh, his talk today is Differential Absorption Radar, a new method to remotely sense water vapor profiles within clouds. Matt, please. OK, is this thing on? Yep. Sounds like it. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation to uh, come and talk to you today uh, about this uh, new remote sensing technique. Um, we're, as I told a few people, this really isn't that new. We're just basically stealing the technique from the LIDAR folks who thought of it a long time ago. Um, so this is a project that we're just kind of spinning up at JPL. Um, there's a lot of contributors here. The key ones are listed, especially Ken Cooper, um, who's uh, leading the engineering build, build who uh, needs some recognition. Okay, so what is this concept? Um, differential absorption radar. Um, like I said, it's just the microwave analog of uh, dial uh, LIDAR techniques. Uh, so instead of using aerosols or molecules as our backscattering target, um, we're using bigger stuff, cloud droplets and rain droplets, as our, um, our backscattering target. Um, so what does this allow us to do? It allows us to profile absorbing gases um, within the cloudy or precipitating atmosphere. Um, so this complements kind of existing um, uh, sensing techniques that we have for water vapor, in particular, which either can't see inside of clouds at all or suffer from biases in the presence of clouds and particular precipitation. Um, the cloudier, the more precipitation we have, the better our signal gets. So we really work in the opposite way. Um, and uh, so we're able to do this profiling inside clouds. And the other thing we're able to do if we fly on an airborne or a spaceborne platform since we always get a return off of the Earth's surface. Um, we're able to do um, pretty high spatial resolution column water vapor measurements over all surface types and in all weather conditions because we're an active instrument. Um, so this is just a little chart um, uh, talking about the measurement principle. If you're a dial person, you're very familiar with this, of course. Um, so this is kind of the microwave spectrum. This is from 100 gigahertz out to 400 gigahertz. You can see the prominent absorption features have to do with water vapor and oxygen. We're mostly focused on this uh, water vapor line here at uh, 183 gigahertz. Um, and the principle is you use two or more frequencies of radar along that um, absorption, uh, absorption line. And the difference between those two frequencies if the um, unattenuated reflectivity is relatively invariant spectrally, is merely proportional to the, um, uh, the density of uh, the absorbing gas between your instrument and the backscattering target. Um, and because we're an active instrument, a radar, um, that provides us with our range resolution. Um, and I'll show you later that the, the differential technique itself is kind of self-calibrating. So you can do this without even having a calibrated instrument. This is just kind of a schematic. We'll be flying on an, an aircraft later, and you get kind of three pieces of information. 
um, you get uh, kind of the above cloud water vapor, the below cloud water vapor, and then more high resolution profiles within the cloudy atmosphere. Okay, so this is um, just trying to prove to you a little bit that things are really don't vary spectrally except for the absorption. Um, so these are actually kind of the frequencies that we're looking at from about 165 to 175 gigahertz. This is a zoom in of the 183 uh, uh, gigahertz water vapor absorption line. And you can see the black curve, that's the attenuation due to water vapor. You can see that that varies quite a bit by ten, many tens of dBs across the line, uh, hundreds of dBs if you go out to the line center. Um, whereas the other parameters that have to do with radiative transfer, for example, the cloud scattering, maybe in the band that we're interested in, it varies by about 1 dB across that band. There's attenuation due to, to the condensed liquid water. That varies by a little bit less. And the surface, if you're looking at the surface, hardly varies at all across that spectral bandwidth. So they do vary a little bit, and you can kind of account for that. But you can also even make the assumption that they don't vary and get pretty close to the right answer. Um, so this is just an old idea that's been reborn. Um, so the original um, paper that I've been able to find that references this technique was from 1972. Um, and there was a group of folks, they were at JPL, and um, some colleagues in Britain. Um, and they were exploring this idea to do uh, pressure sounding. Um, so that's using kind of the 60 gigahertz uh, absorption complex there. Um, and they built a prototype instrument, and um, here's a figure from one of their uh, early papers that shows that they can get surface pressure um, fairly well. So this is not to do profiling, it's to do the kind of column integrated mass field. Um, they wrote a proposal actually to um, uh, build a spaceborne instrument. Uh, it was actually fairly ambitious for the time, so this was in the early 80s. Um, they proposed to do six channels between 24 and 70 gigahertz. Um, and in addition to be doing surface pressure, that would get them an estimate of the column water vapor and cloud liquid water as well. So this was very ambitious for the time. It was not funded, and then the idea kind of died. Um, then it was kind of reborn. Um, our colleagues at NASA Langley um, got their own proposal funded. They built a prototype to do the same thing, surface pressure again. Um, they took these measurements, and they looked pretty good. Once again, the idea died. Um, and then we started writing proposals, uh, I think in 2013 we wrote our first proposal to start developing some of the components to do the same thing at near 183 gigahertz for water vapor. Um, and we also talked for the first time about doing profiling within clouds. Um, so then subsequently in, in 2016 we wrote an additional proposal to build up a whole system, a radar instrument, um, which was selected and we're doing that now. Um, shown as a figure of some of our first observations that we took that show the differential signal as a function of range. Um, so what we're doing that's different is we focused on water vapor and we're focusing on the profiling capabilities as well. So when we first um, uh, started thinking about this, uh, we just did some simulation studies to look at the signal to see how strong it was, whether it's, is it all realistic to do this. Um, and to do that, what we did was we took some real cloud observations from CloudSat. I mostly work on CloudSat, so this was very natural for me to go to CloudSat to do this. And we matched that up with thermodynamic profiles from ECMWF, so shown here is the water vapor. And we just took these things as the input to drive a forward model and simulate what the uh, water vapor radar um, signal would look like. Um, here's some of the results from those studies. This is just showing basically where in the atmosphere you're able to get retrievals of water vapor with different pairs of frequencies. So this is something we didn't even know. Um, if you want to look at the upper troposphere, you would want to pick um, frequencies that are near the line center where the absorption is strongest and there's not much water vapor signal there. And as you move farther and farther off the line down this plot, um, you move uh, lower in the atmosphere. And eventually, the second to last um, plot shows that if you choose multiple tones across this whole bandwidth, say from 172 up to 183 gigahertz, you're basically able to reconstruct the water vapor profile within this cloud volume.
Okay, so then we just looked at some simple stuff like, all right, let's plot the thing that we want to retrieve, the water vapor, versus our differential radar signal. That's what's shown here. Um, in the bottom row is the column water vapor. In the um, upper rows are the um, partial columns. So this, was, this is what you would need to do to do profiling. So we just looked at the scatter um, uh, between our retrieval variable and uh, our measurement. And you can see basically things like to do the column water vapor in clear sky, there's very little scatter, um, which isn't surprising. There's not, not, no kind of complicating things in the radiative transfer. As you move into doing column water vapor in cloudy and rainy skies, you get more scatter. And this has to do with the fact that the, the clouds and the precipitation themselves are contributing an attenuation signal as well. Um, and in fact, also a multiple scattering signal at these frequencies, which needs to be accounted for. Um, and then the, for the partial columns, you see even more scatter. Um, well, one of the things you do see, though, is that the c dots are kind of colored by how much uh, condensed water um, there is in the volume. And you can see that there, there's a, a clear gradation in the color of those dots. And so that tells you that if you know something about the, um, the cloud or the precipitation hydrometeor distribution, you can kind of correct for this scatter. So if you simultaneously retrieve cloud and water vapor, um, you can kind of correct for it. Um, so we took those simulations and we did a kind of then we, we uh, built a retrieval system, a kind of a simulated retrieval system, um, and did a whole bunch of um, error analysis where we perturbed things that you would need to assume to do this retrieval. So to do a water vapor retrieval, you need to assume that you know something about the temperature and pressure profiles. You need to know something about the hydrometeor distributions. Um, and so what we basically did was we took realistic perturbations to all those things you would need to assume. Um, and that's the kind of a laundry list of things that we assumed here. Um, and for the various channel combinations, each one of these plots is different combinations of channels. Um, we perturbed all those little things, and each one of these little squiggly lines corresponds to an error that has to do with the given parameter here. Most of them have to do with the drop size distribution um, and your uncertainty in that drop size distribution. Um, and then you can kind of see like the weighting functions for the various channel combinations. So upper trope, down to lower trope, down to multiple channels that can reconstruct the whole profile. And the summary of the kind of the uncertainties is shown here in this little table. So it's broken up into um, sounding above three kilometers and below three kilometers. And the errors are, are better above three kilometers where the signal to noise is better, around 20% and uh, slightly higher uh, down in the boundary layer. Um, and these kind of worst case accuracy errors, these are the errors that have to do not to do with random uncertainties, but sort of systematic errors you might make in your assumptions about the drop size distribution. And they also tend to be larger down in the boundary layer. And this is kind of a worst case scenario. This is assuming things like you don't know the, the mass of condensed water to within 100%. So overall, this was, um, uh, gave us a positive feeling that we could actually do this and get reasonable errors um, using this technique. OK, so that was for profiling. Um, for the column water vapor, this is showing basically results of the error analysis. For clear sky, cloudy, and rainy scenes, you get this is a histogram of the worst case error that you might get from any of those various error sources I showed on the last slide. Um, and kind of the, this, the words kind of say the results here. So in non-precipitating cases, the biases never exceed 2.5 kilograms per meter squared. So a typical value for that variable would be like in a global mean sense, 25, 30 kilograms per meter squared. So that's like 10% is the worst case scenario type of error. And even in the case of precipitation, it rarely exceeds that value. Um, so then we did some simulations to um, look at this trade-off um, that you have with this sort of technique. So it's a, it's, an atten it's a technique that it leverages attenuation. So attenuation gives you your signal, but it can also kill your signal, right? If attenuation is too strong, um, then your signal drops below the noise and you can't see anything. Um, and so we, we took all that, the statistics we generated from those forward simulations using CloudSat. 
So this is all over Earth. And we looked at how often the various frequencies penetrate to different altitudes within the atmosphere, if you're looking from the top down, of course. And you can see that like 183, that's the brown dots. They almost never penetrate down to the surface, right? It's almost always attenuated. And even these cases where you do penetrate, these are all in polar regions where there's very little water vapor, very little attenuation going on. Whereas if you move off the line, you're, uh, you oftentimes penetrate down into the boundary layer. And you can see there's even a dot here for the surface reflection. You can see that's larger than the atmospheric reflection. Um, and so for many of these channels, you almost always see the surface. And the rare exceptions would be in cases of very heavy precipitation where there's a lot of liquid attenuate, attenuating your signal. OK, so we did kind of that study, and we, we, we came to the conclusion that this is feasible. Um, we, can, um, we can get a signal that's going to give us reasonable errors in terms of water vapor. So let's pursue this project. Um, another thing that we kind of brushed off at first, but which has become very important, is the issue of uh, regulation of the microwave spectrum. So everything beneath 300 gigahertz is regulated. Uh, you can't just go transmit uh, willy-nilly. Um, and so we had originally proposed to, this is just kind of, many of you have probably seen this, this is just a depiction of the slicing and dicing of the spectrum. Um, but there's basically three bands that we're kind of interested in. We had originally proposed to look at this band here. Um, this covers kind of both wings of the absorption line. It would be ideal to use it. Um, and it, we started doing the project, building our instrument to look at these bands. Um, and then NASA told us we had to stop um, because it's, there's heavy restrictions in these bands, basically right on the line. Um, everything is no transmit, very bad, very bad to transmit right on the line. That's reserved for radio astronomy. And there's a much broader band that's reserved for Earth science observations, actually, so passive sounders. Um, and so they don't want us to do active sounding, basically. Um, so we negotiated a deal to uh, move to this other band here, which is well off the line. It's in the wings of the absorption line at lower frequencies. And it's a communications band, or it's reserved for communications. It's not currently used by anybody for communications. Um, because it's off the line, it's weighted towards the lower atmosphere. Um, so that's the band that we're using for our, our build. And there's another band. I won't talk much about it today, but this is an unregulated band. And there's a water vapor line there and an oxygen line that are very closely spaced. Um, so there, there's a lot of attenuation. So they're um, weighted towards the upper atmosphere. And because you, there's oxygen and water vapor right next to each other, it lends itself to the possibility of doing both the mass and the water vapor field simultaneously. Um, so this is just kind of a, a depiction of those different bands. So this is the 183 gigahertz line as a function of altitude. This is attenuation decibels per kilometer. So this was our original band. In these plots, that, that green shaded area is kind of where you want the sweet spot for signal to noise. So you can see this was an upper tropospheric uh, weighted band we were, we were originally using. We moved down to this thing that's weighted towards the lower troposphere. And that's that high frequency band with oxygen and water vapor. So that's something that we may explore in the future, but is not part of our, our current design. OK, so getting into the instrument we're actually building, this is called Viper. Uh, it's the Vapor in Cloud Profiling Radar. Um, we were funded by the um, NASA's IIP program, so that's Instrument Incubator Program. Um, if you care about technology readiness levels, they're there. Um, so this whole thing, it, it basically leverages on this technology development to develop this component over here, which you can see is our, this is our power source, which provides us our about a half a watt to one watt continuous power at G-band. Um, which is quite a bit of power. This is probably the world record um, in, in that power. So that's something that's taken about three years to develop. You can see it's very compact. There's a little dime right there. Um, so the, uh, the goal of our project is to couple this technology with a radar architecture that we're kind of leveraging from some other development um, with a 60 centimeter primary antenna. Um, get really tun widely tunable bandwidth so we can cover that whole bandwidth uh, across these uh, frequencies. 
um, and to get uncertainties of about 20% and a sensitivity, it, it varies a little bit with range and whatnot, but of about minus 30 dBZ. So again, this is because we're off the line, we're targeted for boundary layer clouds and the water vapor within them. Um, and it's probably it's not ideal to do cloud and vapor sounding at the same time, since doing cloud with vapor allows you to actually get a better vapor retrieval. Um, so we're building the instrument now. It's not quite done, but sometime in 2019, we'll do some demonstration flights, uh, possibly on the Twin Otter. We're talking about initially doing some flights. OK, so the other um, piece of technology development that we're leveraging is this uh, very high frequency security uh, radar development that's been going on for about a decade at JPL, um, where uh, this group led by Ken Cooper has developed these FMCW, so frequency modulated continuous wave radars, um, to do kind of uh, standoff pat downs. So here's just a demonstration of a dummy with a gun underneath him. And they developed this radar system at 680 gigahertz um, using the FMCW architecture to kind of do this uh, ranging and identify that gun underneath his jacket. Um, so it's not a pulsed radar, right? So we're using basically the difference between our transmit and receive frequency. So we're measuring in the frequency domain and converting to the time domain to get our are ranging. That's how FMCW works. Um, OK, so this is a little bit more about the, the technology. Um, the guys are very proud of this um, piece of technology. So this is their, their quad G-band doubler. So what this thing does, this is now, it's a sandwich. It's kind of, this is the bottom layer and the top layer. And basically, you get W-band in, and you split it into four. So you take a W-band signal, you split it into four. And then right here, that's this little thing here. There's two, four little diodes here. Each of these diodes multiply the frequency, so they double the frequency, in this case, up to G-band. Um, and then that goes up to this top layer. All these little, these four components are recombined. Um, and out they come, G-band. And they get kind of across the band that we're interested in, about 25% efficiency. Um, here you can see an example of this thing. Um, getting, yeah, 25, 23% efficiency and about over half a watt um, uh, output uh, stable over a long period of time. Um, this is more on the, um, on that power source. So we basically have a, a simple version which doesn't do the quad doubling. It's just a single chip. It gets better efficiency, about 300, or 330% efficiency, but it only gets out about 130 watts. This is the device we'll actually use, which gets a, in this particular case, it was about 415 uh, milliwatts out. Um, but I think we can drive this a little harder and, and get up closer to over half a watt. OK, so this is our test bench. It's literally, this is just kind of on a cart that we wheel around the hall when we want to go out to outside and take some measurements. Um, and then the, here's a zoom in of this piece up here just kind of the optics as, as they currently are. And so here's the, the transmit horn, and there's a little wire grid here that's polarized. And we transmit vertical polarization, bounces off of this reflector here. And then this reflector has a little grating on it. And that polarization, the vertical polarization, is converted into circular polarization, right-handed. And it was, as it comes back, it's left-handed polarized. And then the grating converts it into horizontal. It goes out vertical, comes back horizontal. And then it can't pass through this, uh, this wire grid, and it goes into the receive horn. That's how we separate transmit and receive in this FMCW approach. And the isolation has been characterized here to be better than about 80 dB. Um, so then this is a, uh, one particular case. We had to revisit the error analysis that we'd done for these different frequencies that we were forced to use um, by the bureaucrats. And uh, so basically, the point of this is that we're still able to meet, this is one reigning profile, we're still able to meet this kind of 20% uncertainty threshold um, that we had hoped to uh, meet. And this is with kind of poor instrument characteristics. So we'll transmit more power than this. We'll have a bigger antenna than this. 
and hopefully be able to probe this area that fell below the SNR in this uh, simulation as well. Okay, so then uh, this, was, this was literally the first observations that we took. This is uh, the test bench. We kind of propped it up, looking up at an angle. There's some light drizzle this day. Um, and uh, this is as a function of range. This is just a spaghetti plot of all the different frequencies. This is the received uh, power. So this is basically off the line, and on the line is more attenuated. And so you can kind of see as you step through uh, the frequency is the differential attenuation signal. So we were really excited when we saw this. So then we had to think about actually taking the signal and developing a retrieval algorithm. Um, so we have ambitions to do something more sophisticated, but we're starting out to just do something simple. And so what we basically do is we bin up the data into about 30 meter bins. At this point, we're doing 30 meters. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, OK, so we do 30 meter bins. But it turns out you can't just take adjacent 30 meter bins and do profiling because your signal is not strong enough. So what we end up doing is we take a 30 meter bin here, and then we step out about 300 meters and take another 30 meter bin and retrieve the humidity between these two. And then we just move over an additional 30 meters and do an independent retrieval. Um, so you can think of this as kind of like a, um, it's like I got a, like a boxcar averaging. Each one of these retrievals is independent, um, uh, but uh, but it's not really at 30 meters. It's at 300 meters. Um, so one of the neat things about doing this technique is to do this profiling. You're basically taking different frequencies at each range, different frequencies at each range, and you're also doing a difference in uh, in range. And when you do that difference in range. Um, you basically get in like this equation right here. You get the radar calibration constants cancel out. So it's a very self-calibrating technique. Um, we actually don't even have a calibrated instrument right now. We're building a calibration pathway. Um, but we're still able to do the water vapor retrievals um, without that calibration. Um, so the thing that we're going to explore in the future and there's a lot more work to be done here, is to actually get back to a higher resolution retrieval. We're kind of throwing away information in the way that we're doing this, this now. What's that? Um, it, it varies, but it's in the thousands, typically. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of that stuff is, these are the things that we're actually playing around with. We go out and um, we change things like the uh, the chirp length and how many pulses we average and which frequencies we want to sample. Um, so we're still trying to optimize that for sure. Uh, so this is something really basic that we uh, is obvious, but we didn't think about it right away. And that's the it's really important to subtract the noise floor um, when doing this technique. So this is some, from some real data um, that we took. Um, so the orange curve here is a function of range. This is kind of the power spectrum. The orange curve is what we actually detect. And then as we wait for the cloud to pass by, or the rain to pass by, then we measure a clear sky signal. So that's our noise floor, right? Um, and what we actually want is the rain or cloud signal, which is orange minus green, and that's the blue curve. And it's obvious that as you get near the noise floor, you would want to subtract the noise. But it was not clear to us that as, even when you're well above the noise floor, this has kind of a significant influence on your retrieval if you don't take into account um, the noise floor. So we had to think about how we want to do that with our the FMCW architecture that we're using. Um, so this is what we ended up doing. So first, uh, this is what our transmit pulse looks like. It's like a two-sided saw blade. Um, and what we used to do is we would go up and straight down and back up. And so what we ended up doing was changing to this two-sided um, sawtooth pattern. And what you end up getting is basically um, you, you're measuring a frequency difference here. Here you have a positive difference. Here negative, positive, negative. And what this looks like in terms of the frequency that you measure, you get a, the backscatter signal on one side and the noise floor on the other side on the one direction. As you go the other direction, it flips 
So basically, every other pulse, you're measuring the noise floor independently, and it allows you to subtract that out in real time and not have to either, one, turn off your transmitter or wait for a cloud to pass um, to characterize the noise floor. OK, so then these are some of our um, more recent observations that we've taken um, now that we've changed down to the lower, um, the lower frequency band. Uh, so this is a precipitating case. Um, and uh, basically, what you see, this is a function of range. This is uh, power. We've now included the R um, squared factor in here, too. Um, so you can see some of the kind of structure. You don't see the, just the R squared. Um, in this plot. Uh, but basically, you see the attenuation increase, the difference between the, the curves increase as you go out in range, as you might expect. Here's just a zoom in ac across here. Um, this is basically the line shape. You can see there's some noise here. This is totally unaveraged. We typically average this up, but this is just raw at that particular range. So that is the line shape that we're going to try to fit eventually to do our retrieval. That's in a precipitating case. Here's the same thing for a cloudy case. So basically, there's nothing but noise out to about 500, 600 meters. And then you see this cloud structure. Here's the uh, differential in frequency signal that we see um, out at 1,400 meters. Um, and here is uh, a result from one of the retrievals that we've done. Um, so this is at one particular range here. I'm not sure which one. The red dots are our observations of the um, uh, absorption coefficient. And this is the model fit at that particular range. So we do this at every range. And then we build up the uh, profile, right? So this is the profile as a function of range. This is uh, water vapor density grams per meter cubed. And you can see that there's a point every 30 meters. but Realistically, that each one of these has a footprint of about 300 meters, so there's quite a bit of overlap, as I described earlier. Nonetheless, they're, they're all independent points. So you can see things like there is some structure here, like there's a change right here. These are kind of independent points, right? So this is something is real there that I believe. You can see also that we estimate realistic uncertainties that increase as you go out in range. Um, and so the final point about this is that the relative humidity that we measure agrees almost spot on with uh, coincident uh, relative humidity from a weather station um, that's located right next door using just these points right here next to the radar. OK, so in terms of our um, instrument and retrievals, um, we have a, like the proof of concept kind of uh, 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 test bench um, completed. Our retrievals look to be performing successfully. Um, we kind of went through some of these details about how we do this noise floor cancellation and other little details like that came up along the way. Um, but we've solved all of those things. Um, we've demonstrated we can measure in both rain, uh, where we get large backscatter, and cloud, um, where there's small backscatter. And even with our test bench, which doesn't even have a big primary on it, and we're not transmitting much power, we're able to see out to about two kilometers range. And that's from the ground looking up. Things are better when you look uh, from the top down. Um, so in the future, uh, we'll get a big primary aperture on there. That'll give us about 20 dB gain. Um, we're going to incorporate that high power source. That'll give us another 5 dB. Um, and we'll do some more field testing more systematically, um, potentially at a local airport. Um, or even possibly at an arm facility, um, if I can get out there, um, to look at some coincident radio sound observations and simultaneous observations from other instrumentation. And eventually, next year, um, we'll end up on an aircraft. And we'll begin looking at things like characterizing the surface return and how we might be able to use that to get at column water vapor. So we're looking at um, field campaigns that may be available for us to tag along on after our uh, instrument development is done. So this is one particular campaign that we're uh, interested in, in exploring, and we've been talking with our European partners about. Um, this is the Eureka campaign. This is going to be down in Barbados in uh, January 2020. 
Um, and it's looking at low clouds, so that's ideal for our in boundary layer instrument. Um, there's going to be a bunch of water vapor dials there. They're also going to do these flights that are interesting to us, where they fly these big circles and drop radio, uh, uh, drop sons um, along these big circles to measure basically the divergence. Um, and these are ideal validation points for us if we were to fly um, in the vicinity of their aircraft. Um, so this is one particular example. There's some interest um, at NASA headquarters in uh, organizing a NASA component to this field campaign. So this is something we may do, but it may fall through. We don't know. But we're looking around for field campaigns where, in particular, drop swans are available. OK, so I work at NASA, so everybody's always bugging me about a path to space. Um, and so is there a path to space for this technology? Um, this is just kind of a motivational quote for why we would want this in space from kind of a high level um, WMO report about why we want humidity and cloudy areas. We don't measure that. Um, and it would be useful for, in this case, numerical weather prediction. Um, so this technology would really be something it can't do at all. It just fills a gap, basically. Um, so we have different, we have lots of ways we measure water vapor from space. We have profiling techniques kind of listed here. Um, and many of them suffer biases in the presence of clouds. Um, or they have very poor resolution, either in the vertical or horizontal. And so what uh, differential absorption radar provides is, A, it excels in clouds and even better in precipitation. Um, and because of the frequencies that we're using, we can potentially get very high resolution relative to the, some of these techniques. So the downside to that is, as you go to space, you need more transmit power or a massive antenna. Um, to get the signal to noise to do that. So we've estimated you need something like 100 watts. If you recall, I told you our instrument is going to be about somewhere between a half a watt and one watt transmit power. So it's two orders of magnitude problem. Um, and basically, our technology is not going to be the answer to do profiling from space. So we probably have to go to another solution, um, the potentially some vacuum electronics type of um, power source. There are things that exist in this uh, frequency ballpark um, that uh, the Defense Department funds that would need to be uh, a, a good bit of technology development to repurpose things for our needs, and in particular to get the bandwidth that we need to tune across the water vapor line. Um, so this, read money when you see this, profiling from space, it would be a big push. Um, there's also the, the possibility of just going after the column integral. So this is something that we measure using microwave over ocean, near infrared over land. Um, this is that, but these observations are actually assimilated in models. Um, in fact, the boundary layer water vapor field over oceans is mostly influenced in terms of the assimilation system by column water vapor from the microwave. Um, so we can do this with relatively low power. We actually, a one watt um, source will do it. So that's the Viper source. Um, and we can do a much better job than either one of these techniques in kind of all aspects. Um, we can do this over all surface types, unlike these techniques. All weather conditions, unlike these techniques. High resolution. And we can get better precision, we think, than either of these techniques, because we use a relatively strong line. Um, so what's nice about this is that this kind of solid, little solid state power source is very low mass, low volume. And it's kind of compatible with a small satellite uh, footprint, um, which read less dollars. Um, so this is something that's maybe more likely in the near term. OK, so uh, there was recently the decadal survey. There's kind of tiers of missions. There's like five missions that are like directed missions. And then there's a second category of missions, which are um, areas that people are free to compete there'll be open calls for proposals. And there's a third category that I've listed here. These are um, uh, areas which the Decadal Survey found interesting, um, but they don't feel the technology is quite ready. So atmospheric winds, boundary layer, and surface topography. So we might fall into this boundary layer um, area. And so this is something that we're pursuing, trying to attach ourselves to kind of this uh, incubation activity that NASA is spinning up to 
um, invest in technologies to observe the boundary layer better. And when they say boundary layer, they primarily mean thermodynamic profiles, although there's some reference to winds and um, uh, pollutants as well. OK, so this was a white paper that uh, Joao Teixeira and myself submitted to the decadal survey. This was an idea that we had um, to combine the differential absorption radar with uh, very high resolution infrared uh, sounding instruments, which is another thing that's coming is high resolution infrared um, to look. This is a stratocumulus field. We basically uh, simulated infrared and radar observations. And basically, the idea is to combine the cross section of vertical information you get from radar with the horizontal context from infrared to get at both the vertical profile and the horizontal variability in these shallow cloud types of scenes. So that's just one per particular idea. Um, we've done a little bit of um, simulation study looking at LES to see if this is feasible. Um, so these are two cases that we've looked at. Um, this is a simulation of the uh, RICO case. This is precipitating shallow cumulus. And this is stratocumulus from DICOMS, not precipitating. Um, so these are nice LES. They're bin microphysics, which is nice when you're simulating a radar because a radar cares a lot about your um, hydrometeor size distribution. So it's nice to have that variability um, to be able to realistically capture errors. And so they're also very high resolution, so we can look at things like non-uniform beam filling and how that might affect the signal. Um, so basically, each of these plots are, are the same. There's a water vapor profile that's cross-sectioned through here. This is the liquid water content. And this is the signal, the differential signal. You can see how the differential signal in each of these cases maps into the water vapor profile. So that's what we want to measure. So then, then in these plots here, this is basically a scatter plot of every point in these domains. This is the water vapor that we want to measure versus the signal that we want to get. Um, so this is for RICO. You can see lots of points because there's lots of clouds that are vertically developed here. Here in DICOMS, you only get three points. It's a very thin cloud. You get basically top of the cloud, bottom of the cloud, and the surface. So you don't get much of a profile. But this is better than we get in, from any other technique from space. Um, the other thing you notice is that in, in RICO, you see a lot of scatter here. So that's noise in your signal. Not do, has nothing to do with your instrument. It just has to do with um, variability in the drop size distribution non-uniform beam filling. It's particularly bad in this case because there's precipitation. There's a lot of variability in the drop size distribution. The different colors are just different frequency combinations. And the, the cooler colors are separated far in frequency. And so you can see that the further you get away in frequency, you get much, much more of the scatter, especially when precipitation is around. Nonetheless, on the average, you get pretty good error statistics here on the order of about 25%. Uh, then in terms of the column water vapor, this is using the same simulations. Things are even better. Uh, using the, um, the frequencies that we would want to use, we're able to retrieve column water vapor kind of within one kilogram per meter squared in the precipitating cumulus regime. And when you don't have precipitation around, you're able to get it very well. Um, this is kind of blurry, but it's about uh, about 0.2 kilograms per meter squared. Um, so those are kind of the two options for bringing this to space. There's the profiling option, could be very expensive, but then there's also the, the um, column water vapor technique we could potentially do um, in a realistic uh, cost framework um, and provide, in combination with other techniques, nice information on things like uh, horizontal variability so for the final thing we've done in terms of that regard, this is looking at column water vapor. I'm looking at a one, mit, one watt uh, transmitting um, instrument at an altitude of 400 kilometers. Um, this is basically a yield map. Uh, this shows how often you get retrievals. You can see that sometimes you don't get retrievals where there's a lot of precipitation around. Um, and then in the bottom panel is the error that you get. It kind of follows that yield map. Um, but what you generally find is that when you're outside of the ITCZ or the SPCZ, the errors are on the order of 1% or 2%. So they're very nice errors. Um, it would allow you to, it, you could build this instrument with a footprint like 500 meters 
on the ground, so be able to look at kind of relatively small-scale variability in water vapor that we're not currently able to do. Uh, that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. That was very interesting. Are there any questions? Did you show one thermodynamic structure, which means it's a temperature slide there? No. Um, I, I didn't show a temperature profile. We did do some simulations where we looked at uncertainties in the water vapor retrievals if you vary the temperature. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. So how um, sensitive your retrieval algorithm to temperature variation? Ah, yeah, it's, um, it is sensitive. It's not the, I don't even know where that is. Let's see. It's not the largest source of uncertainty. Okay. Um, things that, uh, let's see, where is that? Which one is it? Um, oh, here it is. Yeah. Is, are you talking this one? Yeah, you mentioned there are so many parameters. Yeah, there's so many. There's there, there, there are lots of things here that we perturb. So one of the main points here is that all these colored curves have to do with things you have to assume to do the retrieval. And the black curve is actually just the, it's just the precision due to signal to noise in your measurement. And that uncertainty tends to dwarf all of these uncertainties about temperature, assuming temperature. Yeah. I think we perturbed the temperature by like three Kelvin. Um, and it doesn't affect the signal that much. Um, I think what we're more sensitive to is actually the, the width of the, um, there's some uncertainty. Actually, the, the um, spectroscopy is parameterized, right? There's a, a line position and strength, and then the width is described somehow. And there's some uncertainty in that width, right? We're more sensitive to that than we are to temperature. Um, and we're sensitive especially as you get a lot of water condensed in the atmosphere to the details of uh, the size distribution of that water. Um, so there are several things. But I think the main point is that, the, that, that we're not actually that sensitive to any of those things. It's mostly just the, the precision error. So, so that means, OK, if I understand correctly, so you're trying to get the water vapor profile. So mm -hmm. you do need to know, or you guess, assume what's the temperature profile. Yeah, we, I, we'd have to guess it, yeah. And then that change, uh, it's not very, well, it's not very sensitive to the vertical variation of the temperature. Is that what you're saying? You're, Retrieval algorithm. Uh, essentially, yeah. I mean, we can we can be wrong in the temperature um, without it killing our retrieval. In this case, we varied things by three Kelvin, which is I think fairly reasonable. Um, kind of one sigma. That, I'd say it's. We in some cases we know it better than three Kelvin. Yeah. Yeah, you went kind of fast through a lot of that. You're working with the differential absorption between different frequencies is one of your keys, but you're also getting the actual absorption profile as a function of range, which could be used to retrieve rain rate or some kind of rain microphysics. Have you looked at that aspect? Um, and that's the so, way um, yeah. that the cloud set, is one of the radars, which one? So, so in my regular job, I use attenuation from CloudSat to retrieve rain rate. Um, but so basically what we have is a fairy, fairly narrow bandwidth. And the attenuation due to things like rain doesn't vary that much across those frequencies. What varies a lot more is the attenuation due to the vapor. Um, the actual attenuation. The total attenuation. Um, yes, that's true. Uh, so in looking at the vapor, we're hoping that cancels out. Um, and uh, we haven't really been thinking about, oh, can we exploit that signal to retrieve cloud water or rainwater? But you could. But what we Yeah, yeah. 
That, that's true. So one of the things that we would need to really focus on to do a good job of that is calibrate the instrument really well. Um, so that's something that we're still working on. Um, so we, like I said, we have an uncalibrated instrument now. But yeah, and or yeah, or even over the land surface to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, when you uh, take the instrument for uh, airborne or spaceborne applications, the surface reflectivity from ground, so you've got 300 meter um, difference you need. I think that may be a limiting factor looking at close to ground, I thought. The, say, say again, I didn't follow the... The surface reflectivity uh -huh. will contaminate your actual measurement, the static cumulus clouds close to a boundary layer. The limitation of how close you can see to the ground because oh, yeah. of surface reflectivity, 300 meters spacing you need for a range yeah. resolution. Yeah, th there's there's no way we'd be able to do this within the half a kilometer of the ground would be really ambitious. Even beneath a kilometer, um, it would be a challenge, right? It's the same problem we have with the other spaceborne radars. So I assume you retrieve the absolute well, water vapor. Yeah. So can you assume in cloud it's saturated? Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, this is actually a good point. So some people have asked me in the past, well, why do this? Because the relative humidity is just 100%. Um, but then I asked them what the temperature is, and they don't know. So this is actually provides a nice constraint in liquid clouds on what the temperature might be as well. In ice clouds, we know the relative humidity can vary by quite a bit, right? So um, I don't think it's safe to assume that it, things are saturated. So you can actually retrieve the temperature in cloud? Well, I, I, yes. No, I didn't say that. But, <laughs> but in that little white paper that I talked about, that's one of the things that we talked about, is that you don't need to have within the boundary layer necessarily um, a profile of both water vapor and temperature, since there's, an, there's physics that connect the two. And um, we need to be smart about how we use that and combine observations um, uh, to get temperature and water vapor together. So that good lead-in. Um, I think one of the really cool applications of this, if you do have some measure of condensed water content, would be to look at covariability of water vapor and condensed water. So I guess exactly in that in that ice water cloud regime, I think it would be really cool to, to be able to kind of constrain what is the typical saturation state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's one of the things that as we refine our retrieval algorithm to make it more sophisticated, we can really use this instrument to do both cloud and vapor at the same time, or rain and vapor at the same time. Really nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering what the what the footprint from space. So it's like what your what is your uh, uh, beam width and what the footprint would be, and and how you think that might be affected because clouds are are anything but homogeneous. And and what how, how, you know comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it it depends on the antenna size, of course. Right. Um, we think with a. Um, we, we think things like a one and a half meter or less antennas are maybe reasonable, um, feasible. Um, with that sort of antenna at this frequency, you get sub-kilometer um, uh, footprint. So if you fly at 400 meters, right? Um, uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty nice spatial resolution for a water vapor measurement um, from space. Um, Non-uniform beam filling is a big issue. I showed you those LES simulations. So in, in particular, in the case where there's precipitation and you get non-uniform beam filling, you saw a lot of scatter um, in the relationship. So that would be an issue. Um, in the stratocumulus case, where there's just kind of like passive cloud, um, you didn't really see that scatter, right? So it's really the precipitation water that seemed to have that effect. My other question is, to Win Chow's point, if you're in the cloud, you can make some assumption in the liquid cloud about the relative humidity. Uh, but if that cloud is precipitating, how how would you be able to determine where the cloud is, and where where the precipitation has just fallen out of the cloud? 
like how do you how do you define where the the cloud would be in in that case you mean spatially where's the cloud right and if, if yeah. because if it's precipitating you might have echo all the way to the surface yeah but the cloud is not all the way to the surface so how do you that, that's how do right you in fact that? oftentimes you'd have echo beneath the cloud um, it's not cloud um, I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> I think we agree on everything. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, so it looks like you get range by looking at the frequency shift between the transmit and receive because you're uh, yeah. you're using that triangle wave to modulate up and down. Yeah. Um, would you also get a, um, a frequency shift from rain or from the movement of the cloud? And do you think that would be on the order? of what you would expect from the range? Um, yeah, I'm going to have to think a little bit about how you do this, but you, you can get a, you can actually use these observations to get a Doppler measurement as well, which is basically that's the manifestation of what you're talking, rain moving or cloud moving. Yeah, yeah. Um, and basically, you, you get it out of this, like an extra Fourier transform in the processing, basically. We're not looking at Doppler here, but um, we don't need to think much about it in terms of the, we can do that in the processing of the data later. We can pull out that Doppler signal. Okay, so you could but separate it doesn't affect, the... But it doesn't affect that frequency shift that, that we're talking about to measure range, basically. Okay. I have to think about the details, actually. But. Hmm. Any other question? If not, <clears throat> let's thank uh, Matt one more time for a very nice <laughs>